Oh, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> hey, this is great. Well, you know, thanks for being here. And, and you know, I, I always start off by, by playing some music and, and then thanking for whoever's here for being here to, to hear what it is I have to play, whatever it, whatever it is I have to say. And, and I think it was <coughs> after 17 years of not speaking, those are the first words that I said to my family and my friends back in Washington, D.C. on the 20th anniversary of Earth Day. After 17 years of not speaking. My mom, she was sitting out in the audience and she jumped up and she said, Hallelujah, Johnny's talking! <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> she was happy. <laughs> my dad, he said, that's one. And my dad said that because he wanted to see me talk. He wanted to hear words come out of my mouth, but he also wanted to to see me drive a car. <clears throat> he always wanted to. Well, you know, I'm, I'm getting ahead of the story. <coughs> I want to go back to where this all began. Back in San Francisco, it was a big oil spill. It was the second big oil spill that I've ever heard about. It, the first one was the Santa Barbara spill down in, in, in Santa Barbara. <laughs> right. It was a blowout. Oil all over the place. But I was up in San Francisco. I didn't see it. I heard about it. But this spill back in 1971 changed my life. This spill made me want to go see it. Because I heard about it on the radio. I was sitting with my girlfriend. We were having breakfast in <coughs> our little kitchen in Inverness, California, which is way north, maybe 40 miles north of San Francisco. And so there we were, sitting in our little kitchen, listening to the radio. A big spill in San Francisco. Oil spill. Let's go see that, sweetie. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get in the car and go see that. an oil spill. <laughs> I, I don't see it. It's kind of cloudy. You know, it was. It was cloudy. It was foggy. That's what was probably the cause of the spill. But we could smell it. And the smell was so overwhelming that it just really got me sick. I, I wanted to do something. And I, the first thing I, I said to my, my girlfriend, Jean, I said, Jean, this is terrible. Let's Let's do something about this. Let's get out of our car and start walking. That's <laughs> nice. <laughs> Jean didn't sound that way. Not really. But that's what we call a theatrical device, right? <laughs> here, here. You can say things like that. That's just so you don't get confused. Um, Jean said, no, we couldn't do that. Because... We didn't have enough money. We didn't have enough money because if people saw us walking and they knew that we were just hippies, like them, they would say, look at those hippies walking. They can't afford a bus. They can't afford a car. But if we got rich, if we had lots of money and we were walking, then they would say, look at the rich people. They're walking. <laughs> They must know something. Let's follow them. <laughs> now this was way before Forrest Gump. <laughs> so I, I said, well, you're probably right. She said, listen, I'm going to make lots of money and we're going to be able to afford to walk. <laughs> okay. So uh, we drove back home. And when we got home, 
there are pictures all over the television about birds flapping and the oil and everything and the seals and all. It was miserable for us. But we waited. We were going to wait for the money. But there was a knock at our door. Are you telling me that that's terrible? Jerry Tanner, the deputy sheriff. We were like really good friends. Well, maybe we weren't that good friends. This was back in the 70s. <laughs> and he was always looking in Gene's yard for plants. <laughs> His family was rescued, and even though we weren't the best of friends because of the plants he was always pulling out of Gene's garden, we had to do something. Because we lived in a town that was only 350 people, and I got to tell you, everybody knew everybody. And everybody knew what everybody was going to have for dinner. And what was going on in the garden. <laughs> So we picked some peas from our garden, we took up to Mrs. Tanner, and we said, Mrs. Tanner, we're very sorry for your loss. We're going to go for a walk to celebrate Jerry's life. So we did. We decided to go for this walk, and uh, it was a 20-mile walk. We were going to go hear the young bloods. Anybody know who the young bloods are? <laughs> All the old people. <laughs> um, they sang this song, Come on, people, smile on your brother. Everybody get together. Gotta love one another right now. Come on, let's sing. No, <laughs> um, so we went to see them because they lived in our little town and they were going to be playing. This is before they were probably, you know, who they are now, who they were then. But 20-mile um, walk. We're going to walk to go dance and celebrate Jerry's life. I know there are going to be a lot of hands now. How many people here have walked 20 miles? See, Wisconsin. <laughs> it's like that. I ask some people in some audiences, they all look at me like, oh, cool. <laughs> um, 20 miles. We're going to go dance at the lion chair, and it's uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Are we going to get there in time? At 2 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> we pull into the lion chair. And uh, they're playing their last, you know, come on, people, smile on your brother. And they're holding everything down. That was like their fifth encore or something. And they say, John, Gene, oh my God, look, you guys walked all the way from Inverness to come see us. And it's incredible. Come on, get in the car, we'll drive you back. Well, at that point, we said, no, no, no car for us. We will walk back after a few days at the Holiday Inn. <laughs> and so, after those few days, we walked back. And on that walk, I started thinking, and this is a, was a moment of truth for me, because Jerry was about my age. He was like 25, 26 years old. And um, he had everything. The guy had a good job. Deputy Sheriff, hey, that's not bad. When they retire, let me tell you. Great job, a great house, white picket fence around it. He was living the American dream. The American dream. And he had everything. He was even white. <laughs> but just like that, he was gone. And I started thinking about that. Just like that, Jerry's gone. I mean, he was right here. We were talking the other night. And now he's gone. Oh, my God. Life is like that. We're here now, and there's no promise that there's going to be a tomorrow. So as I'm walking along, I say to Gene, I said, Gene, you know, I think I want to keep walking because I'm walking right now 
here we are, we're walking. And she looked at me and she said, Bye. <laughs> she was not that cold. Uh, but she did say that she couldn't do that because she had lots of things to do, court cases, and how else are we going to get the millions and millions of dollars that we were going to get in order for us to afford to walk? And I decided I was going to just keep on walking, and so I did. I kept walking. And uh, in my little town, everybody heard about it right away. John has gone crazy. He's walking everywhere. <laughs> This is really a bad thing, and people would drive up along next to me. John, get in the car. I'm <laughs> going to Point Reyes. It's four miles. Why do you need to walk four miles? I'm going to drive right there. I would argue. I would argue. I would start talking about the environment and pollution and how I was saving everything. I was saving the world. <laughs> well, there was a lot of walking in those days, and so I, I walked it back and forth, and I was getting a little tired of that, so I thought maybe it's about time to call my parents back in Philadelphia. <laughs> they're, they're in Philadelphia. I, uh, Mom? Mom? Yeah, it's John. Yeah. I'm, I'm fine. No, no, really. I'm really good. I'm really good. But I, I wanted to... I, I, yeah, please tell on that I'm okay. No. I just wanted to call you to let you know that um, I have given up riding in cars. <laughs> my dad? Oh, okay. My dad wants to know why I didn't do this when I was 16. <laughs> I didn't know about the environment then. Um, no. The environment, huh? The air we breathe. Um, the environment hasn't reached Philadelphia yet. This is 1971. So. But listen, no, I am happy. Um, no, I'm very happy. If, I would have to walk if I was going to come and visit you. Well, it would take a while, but you know. No, I'm happy. No, I am. I am. I am. Okay. Thanks, Mom. She said, if you were really happy, you wouldn't have to say so. Mothers are like that. <laughs> but now I'm walking um, back and forth in my little town. And this is about a story. It's about Planet Walk, what I'm going to tell you tonight. But it's also about uh, something else. It's about the ragged edge of silence. So uh, there's the two books here. One is Planet Walk, uh, How to Change Your World One Step at a Time. And the other one is Ragged Edge of Silence. This one is for sale. <laughs> this one was a prize for the uh, um, Nelson Institute Facebook page. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the ragged edge of silence now and how I got to be that. One. The first one's about walking across the country, and we're going to get there because we're still walking. We're still on this journey. And this journey really is a, a, a journey about all of us and the, the journey that we're all on because uh, otherwise I wouldn't be here and you wouldn't be there. Uh, so this is our, actually our journey. But as I walked back and forth uh, from Point Reyes and over the hills in, in California, there was a... I, I ran into a, a blind man. Well, I saw him walking on the side of the road one day, and he looked like he didn't know where he was, and he was like with his cane and holding on to the side of the road. It was a very narrow road. And um, I went over and asked him if I could help him, and he said, no, no, he, he's all right. And, and he went up the next cutoff that went up into the, up into the mountain. 
and it was a, a week later that a friend of mine said, you know, John, did you see this person who just, Charles, he just moved into town. He was blind, <coughs> and um, I think you should meet him. I think he's somebody that you should get to know because he needs someone to walk him around and learn about the area. And I said, oh, I could do that. I could do that. So I went to Charles's house and uh, introduced myself. And he said, well, this is great. You know, we could go for these walks and up into the trails, which I, I can't do. So we would walk up into the trails. And uh, I would tell him things about where we were walking. I'd say, well, there a blue jay just swoop down and swoop down and swoop into another tree. I mean, what kind of tree? It was a fir tree. OK, he would ask questions. And he says, and, and I would give him the visual description of what was going on. And uh, I should tell you a little bit how I looked like back in those days. So um, that was me. <laughs> uh, I, I carried a banjo around. I couldn't play it very well. Uh, but I did carry it around, and that's the practice. So I practiced wherever I went playing that banjo. Um, but I would give him all these kinds of descriptions of different things until one day he said to me, he said, John, listen. And listen, are you listening? And I said, well, yeah, Charles, what? He says, do you hear that? Um, what am I listening for, Charles? The, it, it's a, it's a, it's a plane. And I still listened. I listened. I couldn't hear anything until eventually I heard it. I said, "Oh yeah, I hear it now." And uh, he says, "But now listen. Keep listening." Okay, Charles. It's, it's, I don't hear it anymore. Nope, nope. It's still there. Listen. And I could vaguely hear it. And, would come in and it would go out until finally it was gone. He said, John, that's the ragged edge of sound. Ragged edge of sound. What is that? He says, you think that it's just this straight line and you start hearing it and it's, it's not like that. It's like it comes and it goes, it comes and it goes until finally it's there. very zen, buddy. <laughs> I thought about that for days. And I started thinking about, that's like life is. That's like how we learn things. That's, that's really very profound, Charles. But then something happened to me. While I was thinking about this, my birthday was coming up. I was turning 27. And I usually hate to tell people the story because they go, you are crazy. But turning 27 was very, very special for me because this was in the 70s and we did do things like, oh, you know, in hell. <laughs> but <laughs> 27. There's not, there's a nine there, so there's a not, there's three nines in 27. Whoa! Did you hear the Beatles? Number nine, number nine, number nine. That's three times! That means something. What does that mean? That means when you turn 27, John, you're going to have to do something fairly, really special, really different. Okay? Okay, I get that. Special and different. Well, had I not been reading The Hobbit <laughs> at the same time, I, I might have done something else, but I had been reading The Hobbit. And my birthday was coming up, and, and The Hobbits, they don't get birthday presents for their birthday. Do you hear that, Sam? That's my son. <laughs> He's here tonight. Um, his birthday's coming up. <laughs> he doesn't want to hear the story. But <laughs> I decided, because hobbits give birthday presents and give birthday parties, I decided that's what I was going to do. I was going to give a gift to my community. What was it going to be? 
I didn't have any that stuff. I couldn't play music very well yet. I could stop talking for a day. You know, just for a day, I'll be silent for a day. Now, I could ask this audience, how many people here have been silent for a day? And I'm going to see lots of hands. See? For a day, probably for two days. That's what happened to me. <laughs> the first day I was not speaking, I went to see Gene. I slept out on a ridge. You know, this is going to be a rebirth. I rains. I get wet, I go down, I see my girlfriend, and she looks at me, she goes, you're not talking. Oh, it's your birthday, this is wonderful, John, <laughs> that you're not going to talk on your birthday. <laughs> the whole town felt it was wonderful. <laughs> Great idea, John. Great idea, you're going to listen. On your birthday, so I went out to the beach and I listened to the ocean and the ocean and the roar. It's this funny story, but now things started to get little, you know, because the second day I decide I still don't want to say anything. I don't want to say anything because the first day was such a very, very special time. I never ever shut up. And here it is, I'm not speaking. And I learned something. The first thing that I learned was that if I didn't talk, I could listen. And I learned that I hadn't been listening. What I would do, and I'm sure none of you are guilty of this, what I would do was listen just enough to think I knew what someone was going to say, and then I would stop listening and start thinking about what I was going to say back to show them that I was smarter, that I could think quicker, that, that I knew the right answer, I could say it better. And no matter what they said, I was so invested in what I was thinking I was going to say, I said that, and we ended up talking like this. Now this was a very sad day and a very happy day. The sadness came from the fact that all this time I had been missing things. I had missed so much. I could have been learning. But the happiness came, the joy came from, wow, I could do this another day. And I could learn a little bit more. So that's what I did. Two days. Not speaking. And then three days. Four days. I had to get the mail from the post office, so I went down to the post office and I asked for the mail. <laughs> the postmistress looked at me. She went back. I said, oh, mail, mail. You want your mail. Oh, why didn't you say so, John? She <laughs> the mail for me. And I, she said, what's the matter with you? The cat got your tongue? <coughs> I don't know where that expression came from, the cat got your tongue. your birthday. That worked for a few more days. A week went by. Two weeks went by and I wasn't saying anything. And now people started to work. People were starting to talk about the end of the world coming. First John Francis gave up riding in cars and now he's not talking. It's a sign. The Aquarian age is ending. <laughs> this is the end of the world. Some people thought that, you know, the plants. Some people thought that, well, no, John's just crazy. 
But I have to tell you something about this not talking thing. About a month later, I'm still not talking. And I have to write my mother a letter to let them know that I'm not calling because I've stopped talking and I've decided <laughs> that I'm not going to speak for a year. <clears throat> and I'll come back on my birthday and then I'll ask myself again, does this still work? Because I am learning goo gobs of stuff. <laughs> uh, a lot of stuff about me that's not very nice. Um, one of the things you can't do when you're not talking is uh, you know, stretch the truth. You know, we call that stretching the truth. Well, lie. It's really difficult to lie when you don't say anything. <laughs> and when you're, there's a joke about it. lawyers, right? <laughs> That's not this. <laughs> For me, I had to see the lies or all the stories that I said about myself kind of fall away, start to fall away, because I couldn't keep them up. I just couldn't keep them up, and people just saw me as I was, and, and I saw myself as I was, and I got to the place where seeing that person, now I grew up as an African-American Negro in the United States back in the, I was born in 46, so during the time of segregation, and, well, I mean, I looked in the newspaper, I didn't see nobody like me, except people that were going to jail. <laughs> Or wait a minute, there's Jackie Robinson and uh, Kingfish. Well, you know Amos and Andy. I could see comedians, I could see some sports figures, but not very many, but lots of us go on to jail. So in my life, growing up, I tried to pretend I was something else. And in this pretending, I discovered that I had lost my identity. I had lost who I was. Because I was pretending to be somebody else all the time. When I stopped talking, guess who I found? Poor old little Johnny Cakes Francis. That's what they used to call me, Johnny Cakes. And I found that little boy, and I said, What's wrong with you? There's nothing wrong with you. Why don't you be you? That was a blessing for me, that not speaking and you get to be me. So I started being me and oh. So. Mommy, oh. It's an Ariel from her. So it says, um, Thank you for the letter. We understand that you are not going to speak for a year, and you can't call us. And you can't come and see us unless you walk. <laughs> <laughs> Your dad will be on the next plane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my dad's coming to see me. Oh, my goodness. Um, and I'm sure he's going to come to reprogram me. <laughs> because they think that their son out in California has been taken over by some strange California religious cult. <laughs> and they're going to have to come and get me because they won't let me out of the place and they won't let me call them, so they're coming to get me. <laughs> Something else is happening with this silence thing that is. Um, I think it's, it has to do with the physiology of it, because when we're talking, when we speak, we hear our voice, we get that feedback, we, we do things in a certain way, and we get this kind of feedback. But when we don't do that, we stop, and we stop using muscles, we stop using all kinds of nerves, and everything changes. So actually our physiology, our physical physical being changes. Now, how many people, when you didn't talk, um, how many people felt some change, some physical change, when they stopped speaking? So, 
Yes. And, and so, you know, after a, a few months of not speaking, things started to get really different for me. And I didn't need any of those weeds anymore. Yeah, just didn't. And I, I even wondered, someone said, oh, you know, you don't have to get high. You just get high on the natch, which meant you should just be able to be high in nature. You should just feel good in, in nature. And, and boy, I was feeling really pretty good. Um, and as I'm walking around, I started um, something, I started painting. And, and I want to show you the first painting that I made, which was, uh, I started on New Year's Day, you know, those New Year's resolutions. And I painted um, every day uh, and kept a journal for about 30 years. So that's a long time, a lot of paintings, and, uh, uh, and a lot of writing. But I'm still talking here, and, and this is my first painting, and I want to show you just how I'm developing. And so the, the next painting, these are, this is grass. I'm right there in the environment. You know, the first one was the sunrise coming up. And uh, now we're in the grass and sticks. You know, grass and sticks. How can I represent that? And, uh, the next one is a, per is it periwinkle? Periwinkle. I try to remember the name of that flower. But um, it looks pretty good. I, and I was really happy with that one. <laughs> you know, I was like, wow, that's, a, that's pretty good. Uh, and this is a, a bay, the Tamales Bay where I live. And, and there's some uh, trees, and there's the hillside, and there's the blue sky. Um, these are very simple paintings. But what these represent to me are, are artifacts of something that's changing inside me. And uh, so here's a tree. You know, this is, you know, I'm out there every day looking for things to paint. And uh, this looks like ribs, but I, I, a, that's a pine tree. <laughs> and then something happened. That was the month of, Ju of January. Then I decided that I needed a, another change, so I started looking for something to paint, and it, it turned out to be bamboo. And every day, uh, I painted, I found some bamboo and I made a painting of bamboo. And sometimes I would, I would just sit in front of this bamboo because I wanted to paint it right. I'd sit in front of it and, and I'd, I'd just look at it for maybe 20 minutes or half an hour and then I would start to paint it. And, and sometimes I would look at it and then I would turn around and not look at it and try to paint it from memory. And then sometimes I would, I would look at it, and then I would go home later that night, and then I would try to paint it. And so I would try to take with me the experience of something that was out in the, in the environment and take that home and, and be able to, to communicate it, to represent it. Now, but I'm still talking, but I'm getting a little bit introspective with this sitting down and looking, and you know, you might even call it meditation. And, I didn't call it anything, but that's what happened. So as I went on with these bamboo paintings, something really different happened. And I started seeing things different and feeling things differently until I got to my, my birthday, which was when I stopped talking. And I painted just this circle. And I try to raise that up because this is a that's, a, that's the painting I made for the day that I stopped talking. That's it. Where did that come from? I don't know. And then after that, I started painting bamboo again. And that ended up the month of, of February. And we're getting right back into that month. And, and I always remember in February, that I started painting bamboo, and, and the painting, the quality of the painting changed. And as I said, these are just artifacts of something that's happening inside. Just artifacts. Sometimes they look like some other people might want them, and sometimes they look like, that's a nice artifact, you keep that. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, my dad showed up. <laughs> and uh, Gene picked him up at the airport. And he drove up in a new VW bus. That's what, you know, the vehicle of preference back then. <laughs> <laughs> drove up in a new VW bus. And my dad was in the car. And he opened the door. And he says, John, how good to see you. And I look at my dad, and I'm so happy to see him. My dad, he looks at me, and he goes, Jane says, I told you. I said, I told you. But you know, he puts his hand out, and I grab his hand to shake it. And, um, I felt really good because I could just say it was a, a very good touch, something that I remember. And, and he said, well, come on, get in, and we'll go to the hotel, and we'll, we'll talk, or something. <laughs> goes, OK, I'll meet you at the hotel. And they drive off, and I met my dad at the hotel. In the room that night, I tried to use sign language. I tried to use first Indian sign language. Now, I should tell you about my sign language before I tell you anything else. My Indian sign language came from this book called, by Iron Eyes Cody called Indian Hand Talking. When I stopped talking, I went out and got that book, Indian Hand Talking. Now, I have some of my Indian friends say, he's not a real Indian. <laughs> but Iron Eyes Cody, he represented an Indian to me. He's the, the, the actor who had the tear roll down his face when he saw all the trash and garbage roll across the, the environment into the stream. And that really, whether he was a real Indian or not, really moved a lot of people. And it moved me too. So I said, Iron Eyes Cody, I wrote him a letter. Can you believe that? I wrote, Dear Iron Eyes, your book means so much to me. And I was learning words, you know, like uh, white man. You know, the white man was this is because it's a hat. We called that white man. And uh, I was, you know, speak with four tongues, great spirit, uh, come. And well, once somebody took a picture of me and I said, Yeah took the spirit from mine. Oh, oh, that's bad. Yeah, bad. And this is good. My heart goes good. So I could speak rudimentarily in Indian sign language if there were any Indians around. <laughs> you know, good shape. There weren't any. And so um, uh, I could teach people that. And there was a little deaf girl uh, who lived in our community. And her parents gave sign language, signing exact English, signing, signing exact English, uh, sign language. And so they gave this course, and so I went and I would take that course. But if nobody knew sign language, then you couldn't talk to them, right? And if I saw someone who knew sign language, I would, you know, jabber away in signs but, um, and not talk. My dad, back to my dad, yeah. He wouldn't go with the, you know, <laughs> he say, write it down. You write it down. So I was writing little notes, but it was this one thing, this one time that my, my dad and I really got to communicate with each other because he really wanted to know what I had to say, and I, I wrote it down, and I mean, I even wanted to know what I had to say so I could see it. Uh, but when I first walked in the room, he says to me, okay, okay, come on, you can talk now. <laughs> it's just us here. What's the scam? <laughs> What's the scam? Well, it was from Philadelphia. <laughs> and you know, I, so I'm saying there is no scam. I don't talk. And, um, and I'm writing little notes about how I want to go to school. <laughs> He says, and you want to go to school? You don't even talk. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, after that, he called my mother up, and he says, yeah, dear, 
Uh huh. He, he, yeah. He, he's okay. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't do drugs. He doesn't drink. No, they seem to like him here. <laughs> Listen, let's just leave him here and hope that he never comes to Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> this will work in Philadelphia. <laughs> And so uh, my dad, after seeing that I was safe, not co-opted by some strange California religious cult, left for Philadelphia again, leaving me there to my own devices. And so I really got into uh, being silent, and I started writing now in my journal. I started making paintings. And, um, this is a, one of the, the first paintings that I made, and uh, it was in 1973, I think, so. Uh, and the next, uh, that was the first painting, and then I go on where I'm seeing a lots of things, and you can see a little more detail. And what I write about are, I write about things like the weather. I'm making observations, I, and, and the birds, just what I see, I think. Aldo Leopold did something like that, it was, you know, but he was much better at it. <laughs> uh, except this was just what I did. This was something else going on in my life, and so uh, as a, I did these, and uh, I'm gonna just we're gonna slide through these very slowly, and. Uh, I got better with the banjo, too. speaking, of course, um, I started writing a poem. And the poem lasted um, for several days, for five days until the beginning of the year. So um, I'm going to read some of this. I don't know if I can see it all in here, but I do have some of it here. I'll read the whole thing and I can do that. Yeah, so it starts out, Manito. Upon the road, empty sack, full heart, clouds play amongst the mountains, tide rushes toward the sea, returning. Wind whispers softly in the trees, feather dance lying on the road. One night is done, another just begun. Anita calls, December 25th, 1973. And that was a really special day because I got this big sack, uh, it's a laundry sack, and I filled it with toys and 
stuff that I made little things and, and I carried it around to all the kids in in Inverness and Point Reyes. And it took me all night, you know, I'd go get someplace and I'd knock on the door and they'd be sleeping and they'd go, oh my God, it's Santa! <laughs> Rang little Willie down and little Willie would come in and go, it looks like John Francis. <laughs> <laughs> And I did that all night, and, and it was just really great um, to the next day. Uh, and, and it's, uh, Manito is the rain today, wetting road and making clay. Manito is a drop on leaf, enlarging worlds beyond belief. Manito is the screaming jay, wanting rain to go away. Manito is the flower, that's the day after. And Manito sits upon a tree. Manito rains drips from a leaf, from the leaves, letting go of shape and form. Manito is the endless sky, letting body feathers torn fall to earth. Manito is the tear. Manito is the yellow gold of daffodils as they unfold. Manito is all that is unseen, something rather like a dream. Manito is the fragrance. And Manito is the warming sun, gracing sky when storm is done. Manito is the one that fell, passing through life's wonders fell. Sand <coughs> frogs, dancing trees, Manito makes up all of these. Manito is the spell caster. Manito is the salmon strong, returning here from sea to spawn. Here wishing shallow, shallow stream where it does splash among the green and gentle rain upon the trees, the voice of the stream of Manito, quiet voice, splash. Manito is the great spirit. <coughs> Sometimes I did know them, and sometimes I didn't. I would, when I went for a long walk, um, uh, I would find people on the way, and without speaking, let them know that I needed to sit in front of them and, and paint them. Uh, so I got to meet a lot of people um, and paint a lot of different people. 
And the, the, the importance of this for me is that it let me be with uh, all kinds of people people with all, from all walks of life that maybe I wouldn't have had the opportunity to, uh, to get to be with if I didn't make myself. And so it was a, a really important experience for me and turned out to be a, a really uh, big lesson because when I started walking across the United States, oh, I just love to be with everybody. I mean, I love to be out in the, in the, in the, um, in the wilderness which I spent a lot of time in wilderness, but I really enjoy my time uh, with uh, all of you. And, all, and that's me, my self-portrait. That's when I was like very young. And, uh, so it goes on like that. And, and this is where I live. This is called Inverness. And this is what I started painting where I lived. And um, I would not use words. I would just paint where I lived, and then I would write in another, another book. But the silence that now has been really growing and growing and growing Something happened. <laughs> I went up into the wilderness and, and I spent about a year. Well, I used to go up into the wilderness every year, but I spent the winter in, in the wilderness, the Kamiopsis Wilderness, which is about 500 miles north of uh, where I lived, <coughs> Point Reyes in California. So this is up in Oregon. And I would walk up there and I'd spend some time. And finally, an, an old miner asked me if I would stay there uh, and spend the winter with them. And so I did. Uh, and when I came out, uh, I decided I was going to go to school. <laughs> so um, I didn't speak, and, and I thought, of, well, where am I going to go to school? And there was a school in Oregon called the Southern Oregon State College. And so I went there. It's the first place I went. And I had some newspaper clippings about me not talking. And uh, I went to the registrar's office. And I said to the registrar, <laughs> and he looked at me, um, Mr. Uh, Davidson, he just kind of looked at me and he said, okay, so you want to go to school here, right? <laughs> I shook my head, he says, uh, and I showed him some of the newspaper clippings that I didn't talk. And he said, we have a special program for you. <laughs> and I was really surprised. And it turned out to be one of those programs where if you go back to school, you can use some of your, your credit. You can get credit for doing things that you did in life, regular, non-formal education. And um, so I, I took that as a yes and started school there and started that program, uh, the Prior Learning Experience Pro Portfolio Program. Uh, my instructor drew a, a line across the, the uh, chalkboard and said, this is your life. And uh, you can live as long as you want. And uh, where are you now? So you could start here at 30, whatever, 20, or here. And you could, well, you could live to be 110 if you wanted to. And so people like that. You put, you know, people put hundreds. I would to be 100. And then they said, OK, so what do you want to do in your life? And um, people, I want to be a pilot, you know, I, I don't know what I want to do, I want to just walk around. So people said, well, when are you going to, are you going to be a pilot, or are you going to do that here? This is, how old are you going to be? Are you going to be 70 and be a pilot, or are you going to be, when are you going to learn? So we had to, what, what she was saying is that we had to figure out what we wanted to do, and, and we had to do it before we got to be 100 and said, you know, I was going to be a pilot, okay? <laughs> I was going to walk across the United States once, but um, and so uh, we had to make all these things, long-term goals and short-term goals, and uh, made a lot of people nervous because you start realizing that you're not going to be here even after a hundred years. <laughs> you're not going to be here forever, uh, and so you had to make a choice. 
And so my choice was, uh, I'm going to walk and sail around the world. That's my long-term goal. It was part of my um, education, my formal education, the spirit of hope that I could be a benefit uh, to the world and humankind. I didn't know what that meant, but when I finished school, that's what I was going to do. And uh, I graduated in two years because I had so many credits from just doing stuff like I could play the banjo, I could paint, I could write, I could do physical education. I lived in the Kamiopsis wilderness and with this miner, so he was a geologist. And so I knew the geology and the natural history of the Kamiopsis. Oh my God, there was a 12 credit course for nonverbal communication. <laughs> <laughs> So I walked in and the professor looked at me and just, and you know, signed that. So I finished, I got 98 credits, 98 credits, you know, for $75, what a deal, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, they figured that out too, because now you can still do that, but you have to pay for every credit. Uh, before it was just you pay for the $75 course, and then you, they'll give you whatever you can get. Uh, my dad shows up. And he's very pleased that I graduated college finally. And he says, uh, this is really good. You know, your aunt really likes this. And your, you know, your mother's proud that you graduated. She couldn't show up. But what are you going to do with a bachelor's degree? You do not ride in cars and you don't talk. <laughs> and so I hunch my shoulders. And um, I get my bands in my backpack and I continue walking on. And you can tell this is where this is going to go because um, finally I walk across the Oregon up to Washington, Idaho, down into uh, Montana, uh, and go to the University of Montana. And um, I have to tell you that when I get there, I, of course I wrote and made application to them and said, they said, well, when will you be here? Uh, I said, in two years. It's <laughs> <laughs> planning. Um, well, um, because I'm walking. I said, well, okay, we'll, we'll wait for you. <laughs> and, uh, I, I walked, it was, I had to go up to Washington to uh, Port Townsend where I built a boat and rowed it across Puget Sound and sold that boat and then continued walking across uh, Washington and Idaho and down into Missoula, Montana, uh, where they were waiting for me. And just like they said, and they said, John, you just got here just in time. Just in time, because tomorrow is the last day you can register. Otherwise, you'd have to go through the whole process of application again. And um, he said, you're ready to go to school when I did this. You know what this is, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. He says, what? No money? We'll take care of that. Come back tomorrow. Is that how it works? <laughs> <laughs> we'll take care of that. Come back tomorrow. And I came back the next day, and he said, here's $150. And, you know, what am I going to do with $150, right? Just, just you, you sign up for one credit reading and conference. You're going to South America, aren't you? And I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> Hydrological systems of South America. Okay, reading and conference, one credit. Now we can let you have a key to an office. You're a graduate student. And you can use a library. And we've talked to all the professors that you're going to need to take courses from. And they're going to let you take courses. You're going to take all the exams, and they're going to keep your brain. When we figure out how to get you the rest of the money, then we're going to register for those classes. They will already have your grade. You don't have to go again. And then you get to go to the next class. That's how we're going to do this. This is how they do it here, right? <laughs> you don't have the money. Um, I, now, I'd love to tell that story because I, it's like you're going along in your life and you don't have money. You know, don't, don't let that stop you. Because um, people will jump up in front of you and say, oh, is this what you need to do? Here you are, and you get to do it. It may not be money. It may be something. It may be a place to stay. It may be some food. It may be whatever it is. But on your journey, um, life is going to come up and support you if you, you know, meet, if you show up. It's, 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 my dad would say, if you just show up, you show up and be there and be who you are, be you. Um, I did graduate. It was great. I mean, I finished my 
degree in a year and a half. My dad flew out to see me, you know, do that thing. And what he said was, son, we are really proud of you. Your mother and I, how do you do this? You know, this, but, you know, you're not going to, what are you going to do with a master's degree in environmental studies? You don't ride in cars and you don't talk. Backpack, banjo, <laughs> and, and I walk on. But I'm still painting and I'm still writing, and, and this is what I left on the, on the West Coast. So this is my house, and this is where I, where I live in California. Um, and this is Highway 1, and I had to say goodbye to Highway 1, so I, I took this with me. And uh, now I'm going to tune this to another tuning. <laughs> kind of an experiment because um, I don't talk and I'm walking around the world and I'm looking at everybody, look at their journey, you know, <laughs> their uh, schedule. After they first they go, <laughs> <laughs> and then they get the schedule out and start looking at it and going, this is the only time they can take this class. <laughs> you know, um, it only takes a uh, a week for us to, to get to know how we're going to do this. Um, I make signs for them. And they're like going, well, wait a minute, what's, what's he talking about now? What's he saying? Like, oh man, he's talking about clear cut. You know, because we were talking about, no, that's not clear cut. It's not clear cut. Because he was using a handsaw. And you couldn't clear cut with a handsaw. <laughs> cut with a handsaw. You can clear cut with a handsaw, but no, I think he was talking about selective forest. You know? And so I would just kind of back out of the conversation because it was a discussion class. <laughs> um, the second week after we were in 
we had everybody from all the other sections wanting to get into our section. <laughs> uh, and they said, oh, no, no, John, just let's us, just us. <laughs> Those guys in. Um, and that was a very interesting experience. Uh, I don't want to ever do that again. <laughs> but I always say things like, oh, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to go to school again. I'm not going to do that. Because after I did my master's degree, I said, oh, that was so hard not speaking and doing a master's degree. I'm not going to do a PhD. Well, who would want me to do a PhD anyway? <laughs> who would? And so I left Montana and I went walking off and um, down through Idaho and across the Arco Desert. And that's a really, Arco Desert is a place where they do nuclear stuff in the Navy. Um, the first nuclear reactors came out of Arco. Um, and I'm walking across that and it's, I mean, it's desert. And people help me by leaving water for me as I'm walking along. Mm -hmm. I don't even know these people. They just I just come up to some water who's there. Um, and it's a really interesting place to be quiet and silent. And, uh, and <coughs> yeah, that's what I'm going to say. There's some, some, some very interesting things that can happen in that kind of environment. I, I finally get to uh, uh, Wyoming. And get to go to Yellowstone and said, yeah, Yellowstone and see the geysers and stuff. And um, I'm watching this. Oh, I'm out of it. I can't even know where I am. Uh, I went down to Idaho and I went to, yeah, to uh, uh, Wyoming and up to the Bighorn Mountains and into South Dakota. And I'm crossing South Dakota and winter comes. And I get to, I'm on my way to, to Madison. I hear it's a really nice place. And uh, I don't make it to Madison. I said, well, I guess I'll get to uh, Minneapolis. It's really nice. Cold, but it's really nice. Uh, I, winter came, and so I'm in Watertown, South Dakota. <laughs> um, Watertown is right on the border. You've got to go down to Sioux, Sioux Falls. And I spend the winter there working as a printer. And I get a job at Print Them Now. And I get to print my newsletter if I help, you know, do the binder and, you know, cut paper and put things together. And I do that. And I'm having a great time. And while I'm there, I start looking at different schools around the country and PhD programs for environmental studies. And I get, oh, I'm looking at Montana. Montana doesn't have a PhD program. But it has all the breakdown of all the people that went into the master's program. And it has you know, Native American and um, African Americans <coughs> and white and men and women. And, and I look and I'm looking and I go, huh, there's one African American. Who is that? I'm reading him. <laughs> so then I see myself as a statistic. That's me. <laughs> and I look over to another page. I say, well, Wisconsin has this PhD program. I'm going to write them and see about it. I said I was never going to do that. But now I feel like I, two years is enough of walking. I come to get a letter from Wisconsin. <coughs> it says, um, it looks like we want you to come here and they're going to support me. No, that can't be true. <laughs> that I don't talk and they're going to support me. So my dad comes out. He comes out. He comes out all the time to see me now along the way. And I'm living in Watertown, South Dakota, and the people from the, the Cheyenne uh, River Indian Reservation, is, they're making a powwow for me to celebrate my, my journey. And, uh, Gary Holybull comes down, and the students from Philandro come up, and they're doing dancing. And my dad is like going, how do you do this? <laughs> get to a town you don't even know anyone and now everybody's dancing and singing what's going on and I show him this letter and he goes and they're going to give you money too <laughs> so then I knew that that's what it was because my dad said that money he knew and so I hurried up I put my backpack on and I started walking and I got here in the middle of the summer I think it was the beginning of summer the summer, the summer, you know, term, and it was at noon, 
Now, I've only been in little towns, <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm here in Wisconsin, and it's noon, and I see traffic. And I go, oh, well, I can't stay here. So I think, oh, well, this is too much for me. And someone takes me to the Union. One of my colleagues from Montana, who's here now studying, takes me to the Union. And he says, we want you to just, you know, relax. <laughs> so we're going down to the Union. I go down to the Union, and I, there's a band playing. I, oh, my God, they're... Coeds and little bikinis jumping in the water, <laughs> sailing, sailing back and forth, and everybody sitting at a table drinking pitchers of beer. I go, place of the devil. <laughs> you'll never go down here, you'll never study. <laughs> and um, I, I didn't go down there for at least a week. I did go up to find out about a fellowship. I got this fellowship. It's the Advanced Opportunity Fellow. Is there any Advanced Opportunity Fellows here? Uh, great fellowship for people who don't usually get to go to school. You know, it's like a really good thing. And but they didn't want to give it to me right away. I mean, I had to go up. That I was waiting for a couple of weeks, and I had to go up to. I want to make sure we're. Yeah, we're okay. <laughs> I had to um, make sure, they wanted to make sure that I was really all right. So I went up to see the dean. Uh, Akbar Ali was the dean at this time, to, to uh, graduate dean. And I went up there, and he was from Guyana. Very naturally dressed, small man, gray beard. I didn't have a gray beard, but he did. And uh, he looked at me, and I was standing out in the office. I was supposed to go into his office. He walked through and he said, well, Dean, we'll see you now. So I walked in. He said, have a seat. He said, so uh, uh, you want to go to school here? I said, it's good. He said, well, how did you get here? I go, no, you walked, Billy. Really? It's a long time. Yes, but where did you sleep? A sleeping bag, but where? You had a tent? We would talk about a tent and you said you cook and I'm right there making a fire and I'm cooking and, I'm <laughs> and in the middle of this he goes, but just a minute. Just a minute. And he goes out and he goes to the outer office and he looks out his eye. And he goes, There's silence. I can understand him. <laughs> I actually can understand him. <laughs> he walks back in and there's this big sign. <laughs> and he goes, so did you get your apartment yet? <laughs> oh, we're going to take care of that. You're going to get a fellowship. He says, yes, you're going to get a fellowship. And he says, that's what's going to happen and that's what happens. But up until that time, I had no clue. <laughs> I had no clue that, that this was going to happen. And so. Here I am now at the University of Wisconsin, and I'm studying for a PhD. What am I going to write on? Oil spills. That's what I'm going to write on, because that's why I'm walking, and that's why I don't talk. And there's a professor here, John Steinhardt, who, who wrote on oil spills. He and his wife, John and Carol Steinhardt, they wrote Blowout about that spill that I didn't see in Santa Barbara. They wrote, and he was there. He could be my major professor. He was my major professor. Great. This is wonderful. I'm studying. I'm studying. I tell my colleagues, they said, what are you writing on, John? And what, you, what are you studying? I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> oil spills. Man, nobody's interested in oil spills. What kind of job are you going to get? I'm thinking about a job. I do my study. I do my final exam. And... Uh, Something happens. March, 1989. <laughs> Exxon Valdez. Big spill. And there's only one person in the United States studying oil spills at the PhD level. <laughs> <laughs> Call that guy up, says the Admiral. <laughs> <laughs> John Francis, yes, we want to talk to him. We hear he's uh, 
What? He doesn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, can he get out here and doesn't ride in cars? <laughs> Is there somebody normal at your school? <laughs> and uh, so they talk to my major professor, and you know, he answers all the questions. But uh, my dad comes out because now I'm ready to go study. And uh, I'm writing my dissertation and do my research. And he comes out to see me and he looks around and he sees my apartment, he sees all the keys I have. That's a, you know, keys. If you have keys, that means something. <laughs> uh, goes, uh, my sister said I should leave you alone because you seem to be doing a lot better when you're not saying anything. <laughs> But what are you going to do with a PhD if you don't ride in cars and talk? There are a dime a dozen these days. I hunch my shoulders, I get my back. It's in Washington, D.C. that I started speaking again, and that's when I say thank you for being here. But the silence, this thing about silence and, and me being silent all this time, I, I started thinking about it, started writing about it. Um, this is where this book, The Ragged Age of Silence, comes from. And I, I look back in history to see who else was silent. Is there somebody else who was silent? And I found this guy, his name was um, Apollonius Tiana. He didn't speak for five years. That's what they say, five years. I don't know. And he was the first one back in the first century. He was a, a philosopher, a teacher, and uh, he was a regular stand up guy because. When he showed up, people just took notice. There was one time there was a big food fight. Well, that's it. We call it a food fight. Oh, I know that. No, it wasn't like that. It was a it was a food fight, meaning that the people who had the food were going to keep it, and they were going to not give it to the people who didn't have the money to pay for it. And even if they did have the money, they weren't going to give it to them because there was not that much food left. Well, there looked like there was going to be a riot and that they were going to get rid of the uh, mayor of the town and they were going to offer when Apollonius showed up. And Apollonius showed up and he just kind of was there and nodded and did this and you know the mayor said, thank God you're here Apollonius. <laughs> and you know he looked around and said something, <clears throat> up, nodded over here and uh, quelled the riots. Well I wish I could do that. <laughs> I wish I could quell all the riots that, and all the arguments that we have with each other, and, you know, from this party and that party, and, you know, from this community and that community. I wish I could do that, this country. And I wish I could just, with a couple of nods in my mind, in this way and that way, I could do that. But there is something I discovered, which is why I started talking, which is what came out of this silence. The something that I discovered as I walked across the United States, not speaking and listening to all of you, and you all are part of this because this is the place, I, I wasn't speaking here. This is the place I studied not speaking, so you were part of this. Is that People are part of the environment. Now, when I started studying environment or thinking about it, it was about pollution. And then I studied a little more, okay, it's about endangered species, it's about human-made ugliness, it's about loss of habitat, it's about climate change, it's about all those things. But if it's really about people as well, if people are part of the environment, then what really struck me is that, well, then our first chance to treat the environment well, to, to, to treat it sustainably, or to even understand what sustainability is, is in the relationship with ourselves and each other. And so, as a pilgrim would say, walking along the road, it's really about how we treat each other when we meet each other. As we say, sitting here right now, it's about human rights and civil rights and economic equity and gender equality and all the ways we relate to it. <coughs> it is about how we treat each other. It's, it says, 
you know, we can't oppress one another. We can't exploit each other and, and not expect that to manifest in the physical environment around us. So if we're going to deal with environment, if we're going to really make a difference in the environment, we have to make a difference in each other's lives. We have to look at each other and learn to be together, learn to respect, learn to love one another. And that sounds like, well, that's very corny, John. Yes. <laughs> those things, those truths often sound that way. And it's nothing old. It's nothing, I mean, it's nothing new. It's not rocket science. You know, it's a practice. And so, and like paintings, it gets better as you practice it. You get better at it as you practice it. You get really good at it when you practice it. So every morning now, I wake up and I spend, oh, maybe a half an hour not speaking. Not speaking to my family, not speaking. I sit quietly by myself for a while, but then I go out into doing the things that, you know, brushing your teeth and feeding the kids, and, but I don't say anything. And they accept that. They know that I'm not going to talk. Just to connect, to reconnect with that silence. That silence. And it's not my silence, it's our silence. And you can reconnect, you can connect with it as well. In the morning you can get up and you can not speak for five minutes. I try that for five minutes. And then you can not speak while you're doing some things around. And just practice that. Because as you do it, as you do it every day, it's like the painting. It's that artifact that tells you it's, it's something happening inside you that's changing. And so I'm going to ask us, as I play something, I'm going to play. And then this is called Night Rain. It's a very meditative piece. And then afterwards, I would like just two minutes of silence to let the music go and let's be silent with that. And uh, I'll thank you when this is over.
Thank you.